story. I once had a mate who married an American woman and decided that to fully acclimatise her to a new life in England, she should try to understand cricket. Now, he asked me if I'd help. I said that probably the most difficult job in the world would be explaining cricket to an American woman, but I'd try. Well, we went to dinner, and I endeavoured to explain the intricacies of the most complex and mysterious of games. Her attention, it never va wavered. Her eyes never left mine. And at the end of 45 minutes, I reckon I'd triumphed in the impossible job. So that's cricket, I said, reaching for a well-earned drink. Gee, that's marvellous, she said. And to think they do all that on horseback? <laughs> now, that's true. And that's by way of a public warning. Because something of the same could happen tonight when my guests include one of Australia's best known and certainly most popular cricketers and two American entertainers who likely think that Dennis Lilly is a pot plant. The cricketer <laughs> is Doug Walters. The American entertainers, two people who made their reputations on that marvellously inventive television show, The Laughing. One is a man whose punctuating remarks of very interesting gained him an international following. He's Artie Johnson. The other laughing favourite was the gal with the outsized personality, an equally huge laugh, and she is Joanne Worley. But in a moment, I shall be talking to my first guest, one of Australia's best known actors, Mr. Gordon Chater. That'll be after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. My first guest began his working career studying medicine. The war and the spell on destroyers intervened, and after being demobbed, he came to Australia to fulfil a secret ambition to be an actor. In pursuit of that aim, he served an apprenticeship as a dishwasher at a Hasty Tasty, a demonstrator of floor polishers and waffle irons at the Sydney Easter Show, and a teacher of public speaking to Bellevue Hill Socialites. But when he finally started acting, he made up for lost time, doing everything from review to classics and becoming a big television star in programmes like The Mavis Bramston Show and My Name's Magooly, What's Yours? The play which won him acclaim, both here and in London and New York, was The Elocution of Benjamin Franklin. Since its, su its success, he's lived and worked in New York, recently returning to Australia to star in The Dresser. Ladies and gentlemen, Gordon Chater. That introduction, Gordon, had possibly everything in it about your life except the one question, which is what made you come to Australia to become an actor in the first well, place? If the truth were told, I were in the, when we were in the Royal Navy, uh, you got a signal to say that you were to be demobilised. And I was in Singapore, and the uh, rule said that you could take your, your uh, you know, demobilisation yes. leave anywhere where British naval transport was going. My mother was born in Shanghai, and uh, we had a lot of family connections there. And the Belfast, which is a cruiser, was going to Shanghai. So I saw the paymaster and I said, I would like to take my four weeks leave on the flag waving trip of the Belfast to Shanghai. And he said, that's fine. And in the Navy, you had this wonderful tradition of rum sipping when you're leaving a ship and uh, uh, sippers from everybody. So uh, they all gave me sippers and farewell me. And up I went the gangplank of uh, the ship to go to Shanghai, woke up with a heavy head, and I said, uh, when do we get to Shanghai? And Pincher Martin or Knocker White said, you're not going to Shanghai, mate, you're going to Fremantle. <laughs> <laughs> and so that you, was the beginning of... of you were uh, literally Shanghai, we were right, going to, yeah. into Australia. Yeah. What did your, what, how did your parents react when they, when they heard that their, their little lad was down, <laughs> down under? Well, my father had certainly said all my life, if I had my life over again, I would go to the Dominions. And the first letter I wrote, and we were still then under a kind of, some sort of cloak of secrecy, but I think I was allowed then to write and say, I'm in Australia, I've, uh, to my mother, I've settled. And she said, well, that's wonderful, but if ever you're invited out for dinner in Australia, always offer to wash up. They don't have servants in the colonies. <laughs> the colonies. And I was so happy when I went back for the first time, when I went back to England in 1953, I was then able to say to my mother, you must let me wash up because I know you don't have servants in England now. <laughs> <laughs> was there any theatrical experience in your family? Oh, yes. Well, my, my father, he loathed the theatre because he thought it was insecure. When he was a young man, very young man, I think he was 18 or 19, uh, his life savings and 500 pounds was a great deal of money. And I think uh, of the late part of the 19th century, he was conned, of course, by an Australian. 
in London to invest these savings in a new play by an unknown playwright, but starring the Jersey Lily, uh, Lily Langtry, Langtry, the very famous actress, Lily Langtry. And uh, there were, you know, he was told that he would uh, double his money in two weeks, and everybody uh, succumbs to greed at some stage in their life. And so he invested his money, and the play ran one night, and it was George Bernard Shaw's Arms and the Man. Really? That was the first time it was produced. My mother, she thought that the theatre was amoral, and I finally uh, got it out of her that before she'd met my father, which was not until she was, or had re-met him, she'd met him as a child, but hadn't re-met him until he was a widower and she was 40 years old, uh, she had, I think, had an affair with uh, Freddie Melville, who owned the Lyceum Theatre. And um, I said to her once, I said, you know, why? Why do I love the theatre so much? Why, of all our family, am I so keen? She, and she was, did perpetrate the non sequiturs, and she said, well, I don't know, dear, because I, I was terribly in love with Freddie Melville, and one night he kissed me in front of the fire and my skirt caught a light. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they really... My, <laughs> that's a new one, instead of the ground yeah. opening, yeah, new that's class catch I'm fire. sure happened, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but they... Uh, and I have been driven, it's the most extraordinary thing. Uh, other people are driven by other things, but I, I always, even at the, my age now, 59, I, I think all the time, well, Dad, I have made a profession of it, and, and I have, uh, contrary to his expectations, managed to conserve a little money and so on. How did they try to put you off, though, actively? Oh, well, <laughs> well, um, I first went to the theatre when I was five years old because my mother couldn't get a sitter, and she took me to Drury Lane. I think it was Rosemary or the Desert Song, I can't remember, with the great American star, Edith Day. We're going back some now. And uh, I came out of it and went to have tea with my grandmother in the Strand um, at Fuller's, and my grandmother said, what are you going to be when you're grown up, thinking I was going to be a fireman or a policeman or in the army or the navy, and I said, an actor, and she took the smelling salts out. And my mother said, nonsense, you can never be an actor, you're too ugly. And that's been a driving oh, force, too. So you, <laughs> yes, well, 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 it was, the, it was the, the age of the matinee idols and Owen Ayres and people like that, Francis Ledra, and I understand all that. Uh, so what has, I mean, one has got on in spite of that, making faces more than anything, you know, and yes. uh, doing, not doing leading men's stuff. Yes. Before I move on to that, onto the aspects of your acting, what interested me when I read about you were these kind of odd jobs. You did every job in Australia that James Thurber claimed never to have done in his career, you know, <laughs> including waffle iron sales <laughs> and all that. I mean, was there a, did you have to pitch? Was there a sales pitch? Oh, yes, and it's a funny thing. It's, uh, I can't remember the lines of the last play. I can't remember the lines of, of the dresser sometimes. Um, and, uh, uh, I can remember the lines uh, of that, that pitch, which was in 1946, when I used to say, waffles are not only del delicious with ice cream, maple, honey, marmalade, treacle, and jam, they're also delicious with savory things, like onions, a uh, little thing and thing. Now, you just take your batter, you put it on the waffle iron, you put the top of the waffle iron down, and you wait till the steam stops, and the moment the steam stops, you take the knife and slip your waffle, slip your, get the chisel. <laughs> <laughs> It's amazing yeah. how, the, how the unimportant things stick with you, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. You're talking about, about your face there. Would that be one of the reasons, do you think, why throughout your career you've played older men, older people? Yes, well, I'm, I've always been interested in older people. I suppose my mother and father... My father was 45 when I was born and my mother 40, and I grew up with their friends. And I've always been fascinated by old people. I love watching them, and I certainly love playing them. I mean, playing... I have a line in the dresser, uh, which <laughs> is very true to me now. I have to say, in front of that makeup table, um, there was a time when I had to paint in all the lines. Now I merely deepen what is already there. <laughs> and, and, uh, um, so I, uh, but I've always, uh, Magooley was a case in yes. point. Uh, I was always accused of uh, it not being a true character, but we would walk around Sydney when we were filming it, and you would point them out, there he is, there he is, there he is. It's that wonderful kind of old man who chews his gums, or chews maybe uh, anything, that uh, maybe a, a few seeds that have been left from the raspberry jam uh, in his mouth. He's going like that, and you'll see that, that same old man with a pot belly, which um, I did have to have padding in those days, I don't know, <laughs> and, and a limp and so on. And I love watching old people, old people's eating habits, which, of course, Magooley had very firm eating habits. They'd rather, as though every meal was the last supper, 
and um, then the uh, and watching old people. I remember going to Cairns the first time. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever noticed this, but every town seems to have a certain kind of people. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been to certain towns in northern New South Wales where everybody appears to have um, a hearing a, a affliction, so there are a lot of deaf aids, you see there. But in Cairns, I was very interested the first time I ever went there. I saw these old men standing on the corners of buildings, staring into that hot light and the, in, in the heat, and just standing there, just projecting their lower dentures, going. <laughs> <laughs> and when I went back there about two years later, they were still there doing. <laughs> I now know where Marlon Brando got the idea for the Godfather from. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find anything particularly fascinating, though, as I do, actually, in, uh, in theatrical old people? Oh, they're yes, I do. Breed, aren't they? Oh, they're, they're incredible, because you don't really retire, as other people do. Um, you don't really want to do nothing from, or to have all day to do nothing in, especially if you've been in the theatre when the ritual of the theatre is such a wonderful thing. And I, I mean, I think constantly, and indeed, I think they've had a great influence on my life. I was very privileged to work with Dame Sybil Thorndike and Sir Lewis Casson right. for a long time. And they had a wonderful philosophy, a lot of things that they've taught me that, that I've tried to stick with. They were ageless, they were vital when they were in their 70s, 80s, and indeed Sybil was vital until she just couldn't move because of uh, arthritis and, and finally the cardiac problems. Uh, and then she was 93. I have to do another story in a minute about another one. Um, and the, the, I said to her one day, I think she was then in her 70s when we were playing the chalk garden, I said, what is this secret of your energy and, and this great, marvellous youth thing that you have? And she said, when you get to sixth year, you must generate your own electricity. That's why Lewis and I go every morning at six o'clock for a three mile walk, then we study the Greek lexicon, then I do the piano practice, then we may get down to the rehearsals and learning the part. And she said, never look backwards, it's aging, always look forward, wake up in the morning and hope that somebody will smile at you and that'll be the miracle for the day. And never, never, she said, now this may upset a few people, but I think she has a point, never, never visit sick rooms. You get the vibes. <laughs> now, I have to say this. I, I must, I must uh, add here that <laughs> Sybil Thorndike, Sybil Thorndike and, uh, and Lewis Casson where if anybody was ill, uh, they were the most generous people in the world. If they would provide money, hospitalization, anything that anybody uh, would need if they were sick, but they would not go and visit. And, uh, you know, it, it's a curious thing, but of course they did have, right up to the very end, this wonderful health. I have to tell you about another old lady that I saw recently, which is a wonderful story, I think. Um, Kathleen Nesbitt, who is 93 yeah. years old and playing in um, My Fair Lady with Rex Harrison, and I saw her in San Francisco just a few months ago. It was the night she'd returned from a week of pneumonia. And at 93, that's not uh, a pleasant thing to have. She parties too much, which is her trouble. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, she made her entrance in the conservatory scene, and Rex said to her, Mother, Mother, and there was this pause, and on came this glorious looking woman, because it is the most wonderful patrician face, and a deep, booming voice that she has in Cecil Beaton's exquisite clothes. And she looked at him, and there was a pause, and she said, Goodbye. I always hate goodbyes. Left the stage and nobody knows what that plays from. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are remarkable. You've had, you had a marvellous... Uh, I suppose, looking back at your career, that the, the thing that really changed it radically on a, on a worldwide level, not just an Australian level, was the play that you did, The Elocution of Benjamin Franklin. Yes, That was did. very significant for you. Do you have any reservations about that? Because you had, at, at your age, to stand on stage and... and reveal yourself to full public's view, did you not? No, I don't. I didn't have... A, it was my idea, because I believed at that stage of the play that... and that character, one... I'm not being a method actor now, but I do believe wherever one can find truth in a character, uh, one should not only find it, but do it. And, and the truth of that man's daily life was that he would have got up in the morning and uh, paraded about his house nude. So I did it. 
nude, and only one reaction in the whole time that I ever did it in three, on three continents was a lady in Sydney who said, Christ, you've got to be kidding, Gordon. <laughs> I don't know. I think she was referring to my appendage. I don't know. <laughs> She'd be dead right. Yeah. <laughs> you agree with her, do you? Oh, yes. yes but no, that was uh, absolutely true, and that play did. I mean, it was uh, originally, when I read it, I said, I think this is a great play. And then, of course, it was bought for America for an international star. But uh, the international stars that they, who could have done it, uh, where people who are very busy with movies and, and people who are, have the opportunity of huge roles in movies uh, really are tentative about learning two and a half hours, or not two and a half hours, two, and a, two hours and ten minutes of chat and to do something on your own, which is such, not just a reading, I mean, it is a complete play. It's a narrative play with an enormous amount of technical things in it. So I think when they got stuck, that's when I was summoned Oh, no, it wasn't quite true, because Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim saw me do it in Sydney and said to Hammerstein's uh, in New York, he said, you must get Gordon to do it and, and bless them. And so then I went to New York, uh, London and New York, and then that was the wonderful thing that made it possible for me uh, to fulfill almost a lifetime fantasy of living and working in the great, great show business industry in America, and I got this very coveted green card, which is a great privilege. You know, it gives you resident alien status, and you can you are treated in every way as an American citizen, except that you can't vote and you can't become the president, which is a pity because I think they need me. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, Gordon Chater will de develop those themes about America, no doubt, with our guests who are coming in a moment. But for the moment, Gordon Chater, thank you very much indeed. Gordon thank Chater. you so much. In a moment, we'll meet the exuberant talent of Miss Joanne Worley, but that's after this break. Thank you. Now, when they come to write the history of television, one show will deserve a chapter all to itself in the section devoted to television comedy. It was Ronan Martin's laughing. It not only pointed television comedy down a different path for a while, but it made stars of people like Goldie Hawn, Flip Wilson, Ruth Buzzy, Artie Johnson, who we'll be seeing in a moment, are my next guest. Hers was the unforgettable and inimitable voice which exploded jokes into fragments and did much the same to songs. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Joanne Worley. Oh, hi, Ogazanimasa. It's good morning. Arigato Gazanimasa is thank you very much for having me on your show. It is an English speaking talk show, but you know that. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't marigatas. Muscuse. You are just delicious. You are. Look at this face. How could a mother say this is not a handsome face? Oh, so cute, you potato. What is, what is all this Japanese thing? Well, I just came from Mr. Japan. Mr. Japan. Mr. Japan and I. And my husband and I, we slept on the mats in the floor. We soaked in those hot tubs. You would have loved it. <laughs> have you ever done that? What? Been to Japan? Yes. Or slept, slept on the floor? At both of those. No, no, both no. Of those. I'll bet you have. No. no. Not in Japan. Look at that little face. No, I can no. tell it slept on the floor. <laughs> Have you been? No. Oh, it's wonderful. Is it? I've always had an affinity for Japan and uh, things Japanese. I think because I have dark hair and eyes. And uh, I do this a lot, right? And somebody brought a picture back from Japan. Yes, I do. And, and there was You've this. You've got lipstick all over you. Somebody <laughs> probably kissed you, Judy. Okay, Let me that. blend it in. <laughs> blend it in. Don't take it off. It's yours. Well, put it back on. <laughs> Sorry, go on. But um, somebody brought back this picture from Japan of a Japanese lady going like this, and it's a Japanese motion. So don't you think I was Japanese in another life? No, do you? I do. Do you really? No! <laughs> this is my Shogun fan. <laughs> oh, I got this at the uh, Cherry Blossom Festival, you know, where they were just in bloom. And this is the real lady. They dress like that, and we saw the dance. It was so beautiful. How does a girl from Indiana, from what is more a fairly strict religious upbringing in oh, Indiana, yes. Come to be as, what's the word, exuberant? Aren't um, you kind? <laughs> theatrical. Ice, as you are. Mm. Um, 
Loud? Is that the word well, you were searching say for? <laughs> I see. Yeah. Well, you know, I was raised Arthur on Johnson's a... Arthur Johnson's My honey heart. Just a minute, Shorty, you'll be out. <laughs> um, see, the, the farm. I was raised on a farm, oh, and uh, it wasn't apartment houses, so no one said, shh, quiet, Joanne. My whole family. I'm the quiet one in my family. Really? <laughs> yes. No, and you didn't have to worry, so when you had to say, come on in, it's dinner, you know, with a lot of yelling. Yes. Cows, pigs, chickens, come on. Get the crops. Here comes the storm. Uh -huh. And so I, nobody ever told me to be quiet. But, but it was a quite a religious and staid background, was it not? Except in church. Except, well, what happened in church? <laughs> That's where I got my first laugh. <laughs> sure? That's a delicious place to get a laugh in church, yeah. as you might know. Well, how do you get a laugh in church? Well, uh, I had gum. And you know how they drag out the kids up from, uh, well, we did, uh, from down in the basement for the Christmas pageants. The little kids would come up and recite things and everything. And I remember leaning over the pulpit which is that thing there, and taking the gum and looking at the audience and going, uh, 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 and getting a laugh and saying, hmm, this is fun. <laughs> and I was so little that, of course, I wasn't punished for it. But they never let me sing in church. You had the same problem about your voice as Gordon had about his face, did you? What's that? Well, that people put it down and said, you know, you'll never be a singer. Is that what happened? <laughs> no, no. But, but they said, shut up. Oh, to they me. did? <laughs> because, yeah, that is the same thing. Because I was loud. I've always, as I said, and my remember my sister would say, shh. So all the, I didn't utter a sound vocally, singing-wise, until I was in show business. I just moved my lips. I didn't even whisper. I just moved my lips to the words when we went through the books. Then I was cast in a play, The Mikado. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I learned fan. And um, then I got myself to a voice teacher. And but you'd have to do all this secretly, would you not? Because I would imagine your parents were quite disapproving of that. Oh, yes. Well, my grandparents never knew what I did. It was never discussed. Really? No. They never even had laughing on her. And my aunts and uncles would send uh, letters to me saying, we'd like to watch your show, but uh, those ladies dancing, we can't watch it. Really? Yeah. True. As puritanical as that. <laughs> That's only the half of it, Mokel. <laughs> <laughs> Michael. But, but they, they do say that, that, that women from that background are the worst, aren't they? Am I, Roger? That's my husband. I mean... <laughs> It, yeah. <laughs> it was arty. It's sort of that, that sort of a cloistered background. The makeup for it in later life. That's what's alleged, anyway. Oh, well, I've got a lot of fun to look forward You're to, right? Indeed, right? But let's talk now about the laughing, because I said it was a very, very important show, apart from being enjoyable, because, you know, it did change television comedy. I've always worked on the theory that certainly on a, on a talk show that, that three comedians, that's too, too many. Mm -hmm. But on The Laughing, you had, what, dozens of these, yes. these people, yeah. yeah. Was it as much fun making the show as it, as it was coming across to the audience? Well, I think that's what the, uh, part of the charm of it was, is that we did enjoy doing it and we enjoyed each other. And uh, that was what came across. That's part of the success, other than being beautifully written and directed and produced and everything. We enjoyed it. Anything you stand up for long hours, your legs get tired, right? <laughs> you get tired. But uh, we enjoyed it, and we enjoyed each other. Yes. And as you know, you know, we're, we're still friends. And yes. It was, it was family. It became family. Yeah. And what about the what about the sort of trademarks that developed? I mean, yours with that marks in boring. Do, oh, do that. You know how that came about? Yeah, I love that. Well, my sweetheart, there are times when things are indeed are you, Japanese for boring is tired. I could <laughs> uh, I did that in a, in a china factory in Japan, and they went, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> they grabbed onto those little wheels so quick. <laughs> um, well, I was rehearsing something, and Alan Seuss, remember Alan yes, Seuss? Yes, I do. He was doing me only as a fella. <laughs> anyway, Alan was being very dumb about learning some dance steps or something, and I just kept saying, this is boring, Alan. This is really boring. So then, whenever we would have a hold-up, I'm sorry, Mr. Microphone. <laughs> I would just say boring. <laughs> so that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this about... is not boring, by the way. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was the thing that I... I got the gozaimasu. Can you really speak Japanese? What do you think that was? Well, I don't Chocolate? know. Chop <laughs> Hi, hi. Uh, huh. You know how we say huh? They say hi, hi. So when you're talking the phone, you just say hi, hi, hi. They, they think you're understanding. But anyway, <laughs> I think I soaked in that hot tub a little too long. <laughs> did, you, did you really believe that, that you've been reincarnated as, uh, in, in another life as, as a Japanese? Oh, I see what you Well, uh, possibly. Do you believe in that stuff? No. My grandmother and grandfather would turn over, as they say, if they thought I was even thinking of that. But it just, I have always thought, ever since we were little, that nothing is ever wasted in life. Energy is not wasted. Even when a flower, you know, uh, dies and crumbles, it goes into something else. It isn't, doesn't just manure. go away magically. It goes into manure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. Well, that's, it, that's something. Too, right? But then out of the manure comes some beautiful flowers again, right? Yeah. But so if when people die, why isn't it then that why all of a sudden do we just go and sit and wait for God to say, are you ready yet? Okay, we'll wait. <laughs> Let us know. We'll just be right here waiting. Why shouldn't we just keep doing and learning and learning to be better people in another life? So it sounds to me as though it's possible, don't you think? No, but what, what? would you... <laughs> uh, do you believe in God? Oh, now we're going to get really heavy. That's down. right. Say it behind the fan if you're ashamed. <laughs> do you? No. I'm going to call my grandmother. <laughs> do you believe in, in, uh, in this sort of thing, God? Yeah, well, I certainly believe in God, and I... I believe there is uh, something that goes on, but it may be a spiritual thing. Whatever you've done, you say nothing is wasted. Yes. Because somebody will remember it and use it later on, even when we've gone. Mm. And that's not wasting anything. But no. is, it, is, it, is it true also that you consult an, an astrologer before oh. you do anything in life? No, I'm not that. But well, this is how it happened. I know I told him this wonderful story that you're, you're, you're huge staff. <laughs> I, see, my first voice teacher happened to be an astrologist. And she would make up astrology. Your, your my vo voice teacher. Your voice was an, was also. Double as an astrologer. Not only that, but a chiropractor. Oh, I see. <laughs> so if the voice did, the lesson didn't work out, I could get my back cracked, right? It was an October. <laughs> This is true. Vivi, Dr. Long is her name, and she would make up uh, astrology charts to help her teach her students. So little by little, I just found out about it. And then whenever I had a boyfriend, I would say, check them out, check them out. But uh, I have never made decisions from no. her astrology. But now that, now don't you want to think, too, that there isn't something to that? Because when the moon can control the tides, I'll bet you say no. You must not believe in that either. No. What are you? Let me see. Look at those little eyes. Are you a water sign? Aries. Of course! You see? Right again! <laughs> oh, dear. Disprove. Well, see, well, I think there's something to it because my husband is a Taurus, yeah. and I have Taurus rising. Really? Yes, my moon is in Taurus, and I have Taurus rising. I am a Virgo, though. Yes, of course. Virgo the Virgin. Well, before we get... <laughs> And how can you say there's nothing to this, you silly goose? I know. Listen, let's get off this rapidly, right. because I'm into very, very deep water here. Worry! <laughs> millions. Whenever you talk about this on television, you get millions of letters from people. Oh, you know. okay. So, you are going to sing for us. Oh, I'd love to sing yes. for you, yes. And you are going to sing a little song that you have composed yourself, along with your husband. With my dear, sweet husband, who wrote a song that Barbara Streisand recorded. My husband, by the way, is Roger Perry, who's Roger a fabulous Perry. actor. All right. Yeah. Fine. So, Miss Waller, your piano awaits you over there. Would you go, Mr. Bajanic, Excuse master me. the keyboard, make a make a, a shy retiring exit across there? Um, the right. <laughs> right. Well, with only about 150 shopping days to Christmas, we celebrate the imminent event with Miss Waller's seasonal offering entitled "All We Want for Christmas Is a Big Hit Song." Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Joanne Wally. For Christmas is a big hit song, a real big song, a top ten song. All I want for Christmas is a big hit song, and preferably about Christmas. Christmas, fa la la, ding dong ding. All I want for Christmas is my own hit song, a real big song, a top ten song.
face. It brought a lump to my throat. I think it's my kidney. <laughs> <laughs> that come up from Mr. Artie Johnson, and he'll be my next guest right after this break. Thank you. In the five years that Laughing ruled the world of comedy, my next guest was one of those stars who made people cancel engagements rather than miss the show. He was a smug, helmeted German who kept popping up amid the potted plants, commenting on the lunacies of American life. He was also, unforgettably, the dirty old man in the park, who every week had his sexual ambitions repressed by a bash on the head with a handbag. Over here, he's been seen most recently as Dracula's manservant Renfield in the film Love at First Bite. Ladies and gentlemen, Artie Johnson. How do you work with this? I this want to person? tell you something. That, uh, Joanne is one of two reasons why I'm in this country right now. One, the first one being uh, Chris Beard, who uh, put together a wild, zany show that we have put together. Which we just saw a clip of there, actually. Uh, well, that, yes, that would not really give you an indication of what it is. But I tell you that, really, as much as Chris Beard is the genius of all time in terms of comedy, the thrill and joy of being able to work with this dingbat once again. Ding <laughs> No, it's perfectly. You know, it's because of Joanne I'm married 13 years. Really? That's right. That's I right. insisted. He embarrassed me. That's right. He embar she embarrassed me into getting married. Really? Mm -hmm. She really did. Yeah. We were. Si I was very. I, I, my wife, my present wife, and I had an arrangement. It was working very well. Did mm -hmm. a big mouth got in it? <laughs> my grandma the, and grandpa wanted it that yeah, way. Yes, sitting in the <laughs> middle of a restaurant, she all of a sudden, in her inimitable fashion, get ready for this one. She turns and this crowded restaurant and looks at my wife, Gisela, and myself, my present wife, and goes, why don't you two get married and stop living together? Right. Nice. That was it. And I, 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 that was the end of it. And when we got to the car, my wife looked at me, present wife, and she, in her quiet way said, Ari, Joanne is right. <laughs> That's all she wrote, folks. That's 13 years ago, and I haven't uh, regretted a minute of it. Was it as, as pleasant for you working on the show as... as uh, uh, well, I had, I had a few more problems than Joanne did. I, I was in and out of makeup mm -hmm. so often. Uh, it was a very physical show for me. And uh, as a consequence, uh, it, it was, I had a terrible identification problem. I, a real horrible identification problem. Uh, which is uh, explained by the fact that at one point, Henry Gibson, who is a very close friend of the two mm -hmm. of us, Henry won an award, and when they presented him the award, it was for all of the characters that I had done. <laughs> <laughs> and he called me on the phone so embarrassed, and I said, Henry, I haven't got room for that garbage. Keep it in your house. <laughs> Why should it tarnish in my house? You have it. And you know, so the kids used it to play with and whatnot. But uh, we had... I, I would say that of, of the group, we wound up being very, very close. And it, I think it's Henry, Joanne, and myself have really kept a close relationship. Goldie had became the big, big star. I know. She's just trying so. to keep her marriage. She, she, <laughs> yes. And any one. And, uh, <laughs> but that was in favor this week. But she's a super, you know, super girl, very bright and warm and loving. Mm. We were very yeah. lucky people. We were yeah. in the right thing at the right time yeah. at the right place. And I think that that is probably the most important part of what happened. Yes. Yes. And uh, that, that, that's where I would, you know, that's, but the thrill, this, Joanne and I have worked together so many times since then. And I must tell you, it's so marvelous because I always look at these characters as being outside of me. Artie Johnson is not the character. I laugh at my characters. I think they are absolutely adorable. I really love them. And I, I was doing something the other day with Joanne, and I suddenly, I took a look at it on the playback, and I was looking at myself laughing, the character laughing, and I realized it was Artie Johnson. I was so, she was so crazy. I loved every minute of it. I was going right along with her, and it comes through. I felt such great love, and that's how I feel about this broad. Uh, when you were, you were Tyrone then, right? Yes, I was Tyrone, which is the worst of my, you the know. Dirty, the, 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 he is the, the El Gropo. <laughs> <laughs> she tears him apart. She comes in yelling at him, Tyrone! 
<laughs> really, he goes crazy. And it's, but she does it, and I adore it. For I, I really have such a good time working but with Matt her. But Matt Gordon, do you, um, do you, I mean, you are a, a, an actor rather than a comedian. Yes. I mean, that's got to be, yes. well, all three of you are. I mean, that's got to be. Yeah, but unfortunately, I, I fell between the keys. I have a very bad problem. In the, um, in the com among the comedians, I am considered an actor. And among the actors, I'm considered a comedian. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I fall right in between the cracks. <laughs> and it's always wonderful to get a story from some, somebody who was in a room with a producer who says, uh, when asked, and he said, well, why don't we get Artie Johnson to play this character? And to have some brilliant, ob uh, ob you know, observant producer make a comment to the effect that, what are you going to do with a guy that comes up from behind a bush and says, very interesting? <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel really good. It makes you feel like you've really You've really worked your science. You've done it to a, a T. That's yeah. a very real problem, of course, is it not, for anybody who gets into a very successful show, I mean, you had the same two, oh, Gordon, yeah. um, of being, uh, it's not the public, actually, it's, it's the industry that that's It's a stereotype. Stops you, that stops well, I, you. I, now, you mentioned a movie that I did, right. Love at First Bite. Right. Now, Love at First Bite, I'm going to tell you that I was the 39th person they approached <laughs> to play that part. <laughs> I knew about it from its inception only because Henry Gibson had called me on the telephone to say that George Hamilton had been haranguing him and crying to him on the telephone about how he must play the part. And Henry had told George at that time, get Artie Johnson, he's perfect. George didn't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Finally, after everybody had turned that thing down, and I was salivating, I wanted it so bad, I didn't care, I was ready to pay them. <laughs> I, was, I thought it was most ridiculous, because I loved that character of Renfield. I loved his laugh. <laughs> and I like eating bugs. And, was, <laughs> and, and, and finally, George, they finally conceded, and they took me in, and I, did, I started doing it. And the first day, George came up to me and put his arm around me, and I had known George Hamilton for years. And George turned and looked at me, and in a, very honestly, he said, I really didn't want you for this part, because I didn't think you could act. I thought you could only do those things you did on Laugh-In. But thank you, you're going to make this a movie. And that was it. It was nice, but at least it was so frustrating up to that point to mm. make people realize that when we did these things on Laugh-In, and particularly when I did a character, not only would we establish the character, we would do a joke thing in less than a minute and people would believe that there was a real character, a real person mm -hmm. doing it, mm -hmm. which is the consummate form of acting. To take and do something in less than 60 minutes of duration, create. to create, mm -hmm. say it, and reiterate it, is like, how can you do that? And I was doing it, and I'm very thrilled about the experience that I had on the show. What, in fact, were they, and I ask all three of you this as well, um, what, 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 in fact, were the comic influence on your life? I mean, was there a person, a person, <laughs> or is there a reason why you're funny? I think that um, a lot of the reason for my, and I, I'm, 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 I'll, I'll start this. I was very precocious as a child. You still are, Artie. I know, it's very, <laughs> I guess I am. But I, at the age of 12, I had already finished practically most of my secondary school. I entered the university before I was 15 years old. Really? And uh, it was never my height, because my height was never a problem with me, as evidenced by the fact that my wife is 5'10", and I, I, don't, I don't even recognize height. I'd never have recognized height. Uh, but I had terrible problem with social acceptance. After all, you take a boy who's like 14 or 15 and put him into an atmosphere where the young ladies are more interested, the young ladies of 17 and 18 are more interested in the chaps who are 20 and 21, and you suddenly got this 15-year-old namby-pamby coming walking through, it created a hell of a problem for me. And I found that the one way, obviously, was to reach out and say, hey, I'm here. And I did these things. Now, I didn't do them. What do you mean you showed off? I, well, it wasn't a matter of showing off. I did them instinctively. Yes. I have no training. I have no backgrounding. My father was a professional man. I guess you would call him a, a solicitor in this country. Uh, my, mother was, uh, my mother came from a farm. My mother was a farm girl. I was raised on a farm most of my life. And uh, there was no backgrounding for any of this thing. I did it instinctively. And that, only in retrospect can I say that I did it in an attempt to have social acceptance. But what about you, Gordon? I mean, you, because you uh, did a lot of comedy here, didn't you? I think I started the, so really the same way. I really started in church when I was about five. I've always, I've always relished um, tearing down the pompous and so on, which was, you know, the satirical show we did. And the first time I ever got a laugh was, I think, at the age of five, after church and, and sitting with my mother and father having lunch, and I just, at the age of five, I impersonated that man who was saying, and now, oh, Father, which I didn't know, and you be thy name, and all that, kind of those mealy-mouthed 
padres who put everybody off going to church. And they kind of laughed, and I thought, that's great. And then I started to Im imitate them and their friends, making it larger than life. It's mm. there, and you it's just a, make it larger than life. Mm. Mm. You, you did the, well, you did the mm. chewing gum. She still does it. Except uh, there, was, there was a time I real, when I realized the power of laughter. Mm. Oh. I was in uh, grade school, and I went to a two rooms uh, where the first four were one, and the top four up to the eighth grade and the other. When I moved into the big room, the teacher was a male who was quite mean with the boys. He would beat them, right? But that, that's not the funny part. I remember Sounds one like of the... <laughs> Wait, I'll get to the good part. Sounds like my wife. <laughs> I don't think he was German, though, Artie. Oh, uh, oh, but oh. anyway, one Check of the eighth helmet. grade boys was acting up, and the teacher went, don't you get smart, or, you know, meaning he's going to get a beating. And I remember I raised my hand, you know, being one of the lowly fifth graders, and I said, but isn't that why we come to school, to get smart? And everybody laughed, and the teacher laughed, and it broke that ugly moment, and mm -hmm. the kid didn't get a beating. You and did. I, I went, yeah, he said, that's not funny enough. And so I realized there's great power in laughter. You can turn really ugly situations around for good with laughter. So I, the same thing, you know, we're talking on that level. My wife, Gisela, is a very funny lady. Oh, yes. And it's very difficult for people to understand that a German can have a sense of humor. <laughs> but she really had, you know, the, they, you know, they lost the war, they won the uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I must say that Gisela is a very hysterical, crazy lady. And this wacko did, the, did me the great honor of going and bringing Gisela a gift from Japan. And I'm standing, I'm talking on the telephone, I'm trying to get through to somebody to talk about something, and I turn and there's my wife standing in the doorway in a kimono and bowing up and down and going, Helga Simon, Helga Simon, Helga Simon. And I'm trying to figure out, what is she doing? Helga Simon, I don't know Helga Simon. And I'm trying to figure out what is it? And I called Joanne, I said, what, 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 is, what did you do? And she had told her, Ohio Gazanimas. Ohio Gazanimas. So my wife translated it into Helga Simon. <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of marching at home. <laughs> all of that and more we'll talk about again in a moment with the three of you for the moment. Artie Johnson, thank you very much indeed. Artie Johnson. Great. Oh, not at all. We'll be back in a moment. These, uh, these two crazy people, of course, at present, they're uh, rehearsing. Yes, that's what you are for this comedy show. In fact, is it, is it very much uh, down that, that road that Laughing pointed? I think the only things that it has in common with Laughing, to be honest, are the, are the mere fact that Chris Beard, who was one of the yeah. primary people on Laughing, Joanne, myself, and, and Chelsea. And Chelsea, yeah, Chelsea, yes, Chelsea Brown, Brown. happens to live here. And uh, we had, my characters are pulled in, but the show is so incredibly wild. It is everything that, for years, we've been trying to explain to people in the States that this show should be done and has to be done. And it is only because of uh, the people here having the imagination to say, go ahead, let's try and do this thing. It isn't laughing by any stretch of the imagination. I would say it had genesis as everything does mm. in some place that laughing had the same genesis. But it is absolutely, to do it, I keep doing it, I say, are we really doing this? Yeah, it's wonderful. And it's say the moment, title. Instant TV. So you have to look at it. It's like that. an instant dinner, you know, when you, one of those things you put in the oven. This is a TV show that you stick in the oven. <laughs> Fun. Do you have any, do you have any problems with the language working here? I found it difficult to understand uh, the, the director, like this, and the choreographer ladies talk, like, I go, huh? Hi, hi. Well, Joanne what? has a problem with English. She's so into Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But she had problems there. in the States, so there's no really <laughs> accounting for no, 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 what didn't she's you find had. That, honey? No, I don't. I, I must say that I don't have the problem because maybe it's because my areas of exposure are much more infinite than yours. They are. certainly oh, are. Infinite exposure. <laughs> no, they're not. No, I. Your ears no. are bigger. That's, well, I don't want to talk Party. about that, sweetheart. What about you, Gordon? Because you're now working in New York. Do you find a problem with the language at all? I have no problem with the language, but they have problems with my name. They do. It's impossible for Americans, and I'm called Chatter, Chatter, Chanter, Cheater, <laughs> Brody Crater, Chatty, <laughs> and so on. And when I called uh, Phyllis Diller, who had been my guest in Australia, she was in a hotel in New York, and I said to the operator, would you tell Miss Diller that Gordon Chater from Australia is at staying at the Algonquin? And she called me back and said, I'm, I'm glad you said you were from Australia, honey. They told me Mr. Shitty was here. Oh, dear! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
they, you but, couldn't get away with that one on American television. No, that is for sure. But they can't no. get it right. It's a good, well, it's C H A T, and I guess it's Chattanooga Choo Choo. Or, or Chitty. But, uh, yeah, but I tell, you know, Gordon, I'll be very honest with you. I have had messages. My name is not a difficult ma name by any stretch of the imagination. Johnson is not that uncommon. I have had people call me and ask me, uh, Mr. Coleman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because telephone operators do not, of necessity, really listen that closely to the name that's being told. They, they'll take the message down, but they will never ask you, how do you spell that name or something like that. I've had people say, how do you spell Johnson? Yeah. And you spell it for them, and it comes back, Coleman, Coleman. <laughs> and I, I, so uh, I, w I would take that I under advisement. I mean. Given that, that you um, recounted this extraordinary uh, school career of yours, where you seem to be a prodigy class, I suppose, no, it wasn't a prodigy class. I was a very fortunate young man. Uh, I lived in a major city. In I lived in Chicago. Uh, I was raised on a farm in the outskirts of in Michigan, and uh, I was just a I was just a prolific reader. I read constantly. I loved reading, and I learned speed reading when no one knew what the concept was. I would go through three books every two days, and my parents didn't know what to do with this little kid that was reading before I was four years old. But did you have any ambition to go, to go into the academic life? Or I had one more? interest in academia, one interest, and that is in the area of ichthyology, which many people think, well, this guy's flake altogether. I love fish. I, fish. Oh, I go crazy. Anything that has anything to do with an aquarium, and uh, I tell you, the, the problem was living in the Middle West of the United States, they didn't know what fish looked like. <laughs> so, you know, you'd walk into a library and say, I'd like a book on fish. And they'd give you cookbooks. <laughs> and I, I, it was very frustrating to me because in my life, but I will, and my, my feeling is, in all honesty, uh, my wife and I are very much involved in the South Pacific. We love the South Pacific. We've traveled extensively through Tonga and Fiji, through all of the peninsulas, in through the area, archipelagos, and we're really turned on by it. We've been on remotest islands you could possibly imagine. I very seriously, uh, when we move, we will probably wind up in Hawaii. I intend to do a lot of research in the sea snakes. I, I really, Ooh, I, arty, ichthyology, yeah. <laughs> but don't you? That's ich, ichthyology. Ich, ichthyology. Yes. Don't you, is that because you perhaps don't find uh, what you're doing sort of fulfilling? Oh, I, oh no, 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 Michael. I love doing what I'm doing. I tell you, you know, uh, many years ago, there's a chap who does comedy in the States called my, uh, Carl Reiner. Mm. And Carl Reiner's theory of comedy is, and theory of acting is, that most actors would willingly work for nothing. What we get paid, and the reason why we ask for salaries, is for all of those years of insults and waiting. It's been uh, difficult for ladies in show business. From years ago, only kind of racy ladies uh, performed on the stage. And that's why, uh, with the religious background, it was frowned upon, and it just, show business was a no-no, because uh, you were a, a naughty lady if you did, you know, performed in front of people. But now, thank heaven, it's getting it's better. It's an art form, and I think it should yeah. be rated to it's as an art It's also very, very difficult, too, isn't it, for you, particularly, to, to be a funny lady, because well, there aren't that many funny ladies about, are there? It's more difficult for a woman to be funny than a man. Yes, because uh, for years, well, especially in the Japanese culture, right? That's why no, the ladies... Oh, excuse me. <laughs> oh, I'm Enough with the Japanese well, culture. She well, used this thing the other night, so help me. I would have <laughs> she used this thing, and somehow it slipped out of her hand. We were in an Italian <laughs> restaurant. She impaled a tortelloni or something. The, guy, the waiter went by and went, ah! It came whizzing by this poor guy, and I think it's a weapon altogether. There are it's eight little blades in here, uh -huh. and when she does this, tsa, you're dead. I wouldn't do that to you. But the Crazy Japanese lady. women, right, they have to sit back and, and, and hide behind their fans. And so it's, it was considered, uh, you know, not good to laugh at a lady, or a lady should not want to stand out and have people look at them, let alone laugh at them. I mean, you, sh you don't, shouldn't laugh at your mother, right? And most Joanne, ladies have can I say something to you? Just a minute. Can I say... <laughs> watch out. I'm going to tell you something. You know why Joanne is so marvelous in comedy? No. Because Joanne is totally lovable. And the problem with most oh. ladies who try to do comedy is they try to be so, you, you just don't feel like you're reaching into them. They are so cold and they are so callous. And she has a love thing that she does. And even when she gets as crazy as she possibly is, you're sort of smiling and you're happy with her. The other women are, they attack themselves I, and everybody around them. I need, mm. a, I need a break to tell her how much, in fact, I love her. And you sweet potato. How much I lust over her. So, yeah. Roger, come in here quick. We, <laughs> we'll be back in a moment with a spectacular musical <laughs> number from Miss Jackie Love and a few thousand of her close friends. We might see you in a moment.
The, the very first job I did when I came to Australia this time round was to host the Logies. Now, everyone told me what an important job this was. I was watched by most of Australia. Well, two days after the show, I was filming a promotion in Melbourne. I was approached by a lady who asked me what I was doing in Australia, and I explained I was going to start a series of talk shows. She didn't seem very interested because she said she didn't watch very much television. Did you watch the Logies? I asked. She said she did. What did you think of it? I asked. Well, it was all right, she said, except I didn't like the guy who took Bert's place. <laughs> well, so, so much for stardom. All of which leads me quite naturally to my next guest, because if you watched the show, you'd have been bound to have been impressed by her style and talent. Backed by a cast of thousands, including the lead chamber dancers, Miss Jackie Love, and I'm happy just to dance with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackie Love. Talented Miss Jackie Love and Artie Johnson for once delighted that she's on the same show as he is. That's the instant <laughs> television show. Now, uh, we're going to cricket in a moment. Gordon, do you know anything about cricket at all? I was very bad at it and gave it away when I was young after I'd been beaten at school for dancing Swan Lake at Cover Point. That's a very good reason. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my final guest tonight is arguably the, the most popular cricket in Australia, yeah. and we will meet him in just a moment, after this break. Uh, <laughs> As I said, my final guest tonight is arguably the most popular cricketer in Australia. When he wasn't picked to tour England this year, public reaction ranged from protest marches, questions in Parliament, and even a, a, a crank death threat to one of the selectors. The man at the centre of all this controversy simply kept his cool, which is his style, and has been so ever since he came out of the bush to score a century in the first of his 74 tests. It's a mark of the special place he holds with the Australian public that he's the first New South Wales cricketer to be granted a benefit year and the only Australian cricketer to have had a stand named after him by the crowd on the hill at the Sydney Cricket Ground. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug Walters. <laughs> Right, Doug, we mentioned there that you were left out um, of this test series. You've had a bit of time to sort of think about it now. Do you th think, in fact, that the selectors were justified in leaving you out? Well, I think uh, the final outcome of the series in England uh, taking place at the moment will probably uh, uh, bear that out, Michael. But uh, I was a little bit disappointed uh, in the beginning of, at being left out. Uh, that, uh, my employers have been a little bit happier about the fact that I have been left out. I'm quite convinced of that. Uh, they're seeing me a little bit more in the office. And uh, certainly my, my young son, uh, who's uh, just, just five, he, he was uh, very impressed with the fact that I was left out of the cell. Was he? He's, he's old five, you say? Yes, he's five. Uh, and in fact, uh, the day after the team was announced, uh, I was driving to Newcastle for a benefit dinner they had there. And I was in the station wagon and he was sitting in the back and he turned round and had a look in the back, at the back of the station wagon and said, Dad, he said, uh, where's that black bag of yours? And I said, what black bag, mate? He said, you know that black bag that uh, you always carry in the back with all your cricket gear in? And I said, oh, look, I'm, I'm not going up Newcastle to play in a cricket match. I'm, I'm just going up there to talk at a dinner. And he said, oh, I won't they even let you play in Australia either now, Dad. He said. <laughs> Is he, is he very wise and knowledgeable about cricket, your, your lad? Well, I didn't think, uh, I didn't think he was particularly, uh, but he, he certainly showed a lot of interest, uh, especially towards the end of last season. And uh, he obviously followed a little bit closer than what I thought. Uh, in fact, after that, uh, that famous underarm incident in Melbourne, um, I didn't think he'd been following it all that closely at that stage. And I was watching, uh, while well, he was he was watching the late news the following day. And uh, it, was, it received quite a bit of publicity, as you well know, uh, all over the world. And uh, I was inside writing a few letters. And he came running in and he said, Dad, he said, uh, you should have seen what Trev just done. <laughs> I said, what did he do? And he said, oh, he bowled underarm. And he went through the motions of showing me how he'd done it. 
And uh, he said, the batsman got angry and threw his bat away. He said, I don't know why, Dad. He said, because I could have hit that one, couldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Uncle and Mums and Babes, yeah. What do you think yourself, though, of that, of that incident? Well, I, I think, uh, like just about everyone else, I think it was an incident that could have easily have been done without. I'm quite sure that uh, the Greg Chapel feels exactly the same way and did feel exactly the same way perhaps five minutes after the event. Uh, it was certainly not against the laws of play, uh, but certainly uh, it was something that uh, cricket could have done without. But it was outside the spirit of the game, wasn't it? That was the thing. Well, it, it was, and uh, I, I think that uh, whilst it, I, I feel it was overplayed in the, the media, uh, for the following few days and I was talking to Jeff Howarth in New Zealand not long ago and he said the Prime Minister of New Zealand hasn't forgiven us about that yet. No, 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 he was very angry, wasn't he? <laughs> Nearly severed diplomatic relations, it's like the bodyline tour all over again. But what do you think though about the going on from that incident? I mean, it, it, it seemed to me that seemed to be just one of a, of a few incidents that have crept into, into cricket, uh, in sport generally actually, over the past ten years or more. Now, you've been in the game since you were 19. You've, you've played at top, most international level. Do you think it's a, a, it's a less sporting game than it was when you started? Um, perhaps it is slightly. I, I don't think uh, uh, the same enjoyment is probably there as it used to be. Uh, and everyone used to play it hard, and everyone still plays it hard. Uh, and I think that's the way cricket should be played. I, I'm quite sure that everyone that goes onto the field uh, tries to play it that way. Um, I think uh, it's certainly become a little bit more competitive. Uh, we're certainly playing a lot more cricket. I think uh, that has got a lot to do with it. I'm gone are the days uh, where the six o'clock came, you grabbed a couple of cans out of the fridge and raced down to the other end, uh, the other dressing room, and had a had a beer with uh, with the opposition. I think because we are in fact now playing uh, far more games and uh, the teams are often, often staying in the same hotels, you think, well, we'll see them tomorrow or we'll see them back at the hotel. Mm. And that, unfortunately, I think has changed a little. But what about what, what happens on the field? You said the game's become more competitive. We won't talk about money yet, because I know you have very strong views on that. But I'm talking about attitudes. I mean, I was over in West Indies and watching the, the West Indies demolish my team. Um, and it seemed to me then that, that what's happened now in cricket, which is very, very dangerous, is that the target area has changed. So you've got these four West Indian quicks who are actually not bowling at the stumps anymore. They're bowling at a, a position which is between your sort of uh, your bone there and the top of your head. And it seems to me that that is against the spirit of the game. It's a very dangerous game nowadays. Well, that's, uh, that's probably the reason that uh, I've put the helmet on, uh, Michael, in the last couple of years. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, whilst the West Indies have certainly got a tremendous side, and I, I think uh, a side that uh, won't be beaten by any country for a few years yet, I think uh, good luck to the West Indies for, for having that bowling combination and uh, to have the bowlers to, to bowl at that uh, given spot. And uh, you talk about uh, bouncers, uh, a bouncer as uh, a lot of people uh, refer to a bouncer as a ball that is short and goes over one's head. Uh, and that doesn't uh, cause the batsman too much problem at all. And it is, in fact, the ball that, as that area you just described... A throat ball. ...is the ball that uh, batsmen have a lot of trouble with. And I think uh, one of your countrymen, John Snow, was probably the first that I come across that uh, introduced that ball and uh, he was one of the most accurate bowlers that I've faced. And I thought he bowled it uh, very well, uh, round about 1971, 72, I think. Um, but bowlers now, we've certainly got far more fast bowlers around, uh, and they're all aiming around that, that part. And uh, it is very awkward uh, as far it's as... It's a more dangerous game. game, yeah. I mean, you, you, I mean, you can't relish it as much from the physical point of view as you did when you, when you first came in. But, but I mean, let me, let me ask you something else. What's, what's been in all your career? What's been the most... Because, see, Americans don't think that, that cricket's dangerous, you see. Well, I was yeah. having no, a little no. yarn to Artie at the, at the back earlier on, but, and uh, I was surprised that uh, uh, you know so much about Well, cricket. can I just ask you after this, because can I ask you what was the worst thing that ever happened to you in 19 years of... Or, or, or not more than 19 years of cricket? 
But what, what was the most dangerous moment? Well, uh, I think if I had to nominate one ball, uh, and uh, I still think that's probably the fastest delivery that, uh, that I've faced, uh, it came from a fellow uh, by the name of Charlie Griffiths, I'm not quite sure whether he bowled it. Or threw it. <laughs> you said that. Well, it's double top, he used to throw from there, like that. Yeah. Uh, Charlie and, uh, and Wes Hall at the time uh, had just been dropped to tour England. Uh, they were here in 1968-69. And I'd been seeing the ball fairly well because I, I got a double century in the first innings and I was about 80 not out in the second innings. And uh, Charlie came in and let this one go the morning after the, the side had been announced uh, to tour England that they weren't in. And uh, he decided that he'd go back to his old action and uh, try and prove to the selectors that uh, he was still bowling a little bit quick. And uh, he let me have this one ball, which uh, sort of landed just outside off stump, a little bit short, and cut back in. And this grazed the side of my forehead as it went past, and I pulled the muscle getting out of the way, or falling out of the way. <laughs> but uh, that, that was one ball. Which could conceivably have killed you, actually, if you were smack on the, on the forehead. Well, yes, I uh, would have liked to have had a helmet on, I think, in that occasion. That's right. Aren't you going to say something about well, cricket, about which you know nothing? No, 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 I'm not going to say I know nothing. He knows, I, I know. I'm going to say I know nothing. We have matches in the States, in California, because there are so many people from uh, Great Britain and from the uh, Commonwealth who live in and around the, the environs of Los Angeles, and every Sunday they go out and they play. But I was telling, I, I, we were talking backstage, and I told him that I have a very dear friend of mine who's a captain on one of the P&O liners, and he's an avid cricketer, loves cricket. And there was an article in a, our sports magazine in the States called Sports Illustrated, and it was sort of an ad, ad it was a, an addendum to violence in all forms of sport, where they had gone after hockey basketball, yes, whatnot, it's where it's been tremendous. And suddenly somebody came up with this article, when are we going to stop violence in cricket? And they came down with a list of like 30 incidents of tremendously physical, terrible things that had occurred in the form in cricket matches. And the incidents you're talking about with the New Zealand, mm. Australia thing, mm. that made quite a bit of splash in the uh, Los Angeles papers, mm. particularly. It was everybody knew what was happening, and yeah. it was followed up quite extensively. You know, it was an American who first pointed out the potential uh, the way that sport was going, cricket was going, about its danger, Ernest Hemingway, uh, who once wrote an article in which he said that uh, spring was upon us, and over in England, the cricketers were preparing for their season by sharpening their stumps. <laughs> 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 amazing. Yeah. But let's go back to you a bit, Doug, actually, because... Um, you came, I mean, you're a country boy, like, like uh, Artie was saying, you know, I mean, you came yeah. out of the bush, didn't you? Yes, I did, uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, Michael. But, uh, I, uh, I enjoyed those, li those years uh, living in the country. I, I now guess I, I call myself a, a, city, a city boy uh, because I now, in fact, lived in the city longer than I did, uh, in fact, live in the country. But I certainly uh, learnt my cricket. Uh, from the country areas. And you never had any coaching though, did you? No, well, the, the facilities uh, weren't around at that stage, uh, like they are available at uh, present days. Where do you get this marvellous, unflappable temperament from too? Because there are marvellous stories told about you, about the unflappability. I mean, the marvellous story about you is that you're playing cards in the pavilion and taking no notice to the play at all. And all of a sudden, they say, you're, on, you're in, Dougie, the guy's out. So you just give it, say, hold those, I won't be a minute. And you walk up. <laughs> now, now, is, that, is that true or false? Uh, no, I think that that's fairly true. I, uh, <laughs> I uh, don't believe in worrying uh, uh, about the occasion until you're confronted with it. Uh, that is one of the reasons uh, I like to relax. Uh, I do get the pack of cards out occasionally in the dressing room. Uh, but. Whilst I am playing cards, or if I'm not playing cards, I, I'm probably doing a crossword puzzle or something. Mm. Uh, whilst I am doing either, uh, I've still got one eye on what is happening out there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to a certain degree, it relaxes me. And uh, well, as I said, I, when you walk out that gate, is the time to start uh, getting 
hundred percent. But, but you're very lucky actually to have a temperament like that because I mean a lot of a lot of people in our business, a lot of people certainly in sport that I know, are so nervous before they go out to to the event. I mean, um, there's one guy who plays in English county cricket whose nickname is WC because he spends so much time in the toilet <laughs> before he goes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. I, mean. <laughs> yes, uh, I think it's uh, an individual thing, uh, and every uh, every cricketer or every sportsman, I, I presume, is totally different from uh, from the other. Uh, but I, I think uh, it certainly uh, helps if you can relax just that little bit before uh, going out to to do whatever you're going to do, bat or bowl or field, doesn't matter. Well, Dougie, I'm, I'm going to wish you um, all the best in your, this benefit year you've got. I mean, that's a singular honour, isn't it? You're the first New South Wales cricketer to, to get a benefit, and uh, I hope that you know the public reward your service by uh, by giving you lots of, of money. Um, yeah. I wish I could say the same about your team in Australia and be as, in, in, in England and be as kind about them. My thoughts are not with them, actually. They're with the other side. You want, you're not a betting man, are you? I might have been. <laughs> you're not a betting man? I have a little punt now and again, Mark. You do, do you? You like a few bob on this series? Uh, I think it's very, uh, it's a very interesting series. And, what a phrase, uh, a good phrase. I think, yeah. Yeah. Use it. Yeah. I think if Australia are going to bring those ashes back, uh, I, I sincerely think that they're going to miss... Uh, Greg Chapel there, uh, and he makes a big hole on any side. That's right, world-class player. And uh, if they're going to bring the Ashes back, then the Australian boys, all of them, have got to play to their best ability. Right. Well, we'll but we'll strike the bet later after this show, ladies and gentlemen. For the moment, Dougie Walters. Thank you very much, indeed. Dougie Walters. Thank you. Right. We'll be back to wrap up the show right after this break. See you in a moment. Well, that's it then, the end of the show, and I hope you enjoyed it. My thanks to Gordon Chater, and all the best with the dresser, Gordon, Thank to you. Joanna Worley and Artie Johnson, all the best with your instant television show, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen, to Miss Jackie Love, and, of course, Mr Doug Walters. We'll be back at the same time next Saturday. Until then, from all of us here, good night, a very good night. <laughs>